Uh, welcome back. This is the, uh, I think, fifth accompanying video for the tutorial on phylogenetics back to basics. And now I'm going to talk about maximum likelihood as the way to estimate trees from our alignments. So uh, likelihood might be a new concept for, for you. Uh, you can think of it as a way of selecting models given data. It's not just probability, it's more sophisticated than that, uh, but that's a good way for us to be thinking about it to start with. So why likelihood? Well, there's statistical rigor that's offered by using likelihood. Likelihood allows us to use um, uh, statistical arguments. It requires us to have a model that describes what we think is going on, and it enables us to be able to defend those models on statistical bases. It also allows us to compare hypotheses. So a hypothesis might be that this model describes the evolution of the molecular sequences that we're using, or some other model does, or that there is a steady molecular clock uh, going in our, uh, in our sequences, or that there isn't. So it's very useful to allow us to compare hypotheses, again, on a sound statistical basis. It's also very accurate. So maximum likelihood or likelihood is generally the most accurate method around currently to do phylogenetic analysis. So that's a negative point in its favor. The only downside of likelihood is it takes longer than simply building a tree, but these advantages, I think, outweigh that disadvantage um, in most cases. So what is likelihood? Well, the likelihood of a model is a quantity that is proportional to the probability that the model gave you your observed data. So it's not quite the same as the probability that it gives you the data, but it's something that's proportional to that. And you'll see why it's not the probability later, but it's this, this proportionality is important to remember, although in practice, we tend to forget about it. So it's just worthwhile not confusing the likelihood with a probability, particularly a probability that the model is correct, because it's not that true. It's relatively easy to calculate the probability of some data given a model. So if you are accepting that it's a particular molecular sequence model or a substitution matrix, it's generally straightforward to calculate the probability. And with that, the maximum likelihood approach for phylogenetics attempts to find the model and that includes the tree, the substitution rates, the substitution matrix, and perhaps other parameters that maximizes that probability. And we call that um, that model, including tree, branch lengths, all of that, the maximum likelihood tree once we've found it. So let's start with a simple example uh, based on some dice. And Let's imagine that I have a set of very strange 10 sided dice. And the size of these dice have the numbers one to six on them, but in different proportions. So the blue die has labels one, one, two, three, four, five, five, six, six, six. And the size of the red die are one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, six. So it's more likely, for example, to get a, a six on my blue die than it is on my red die. So they have the same range of possible outcomes. And we can figure they, these as models, um, but the relative probabilities of those outcomes are different. So I've just tabulated those here and they sum to one, which means that I can use them as probabilities. So suppose I've chosen a die, I haven't told you what it is, and I roll it three times and I get the values three, six, and two. So I can ask myself, well, I could ask you, which die is the most likely to have been used? So the likelihood, remember, is going to be the pro is going to be proportional to the probability of the different outcomes under the different models. So if it were the blue die, then I can go back and look on my table for the values three, six, and two, and find that their probabilities are 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.1. So let's just check three, six, and two, 0 0.1, 0 0.3. Point one. So the product of those, because all three events have to happen and they're independent, 
I can just multiply those probabilities together and I get the total probability of that particular outcome of 0 0.003. I can do exactly the same for the red die, looking at the relative probabilities for each of the possible scores. And they come out as slightly different, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and 0 0.2. And so the total probability under the, the red model is 0 0.004. So it's important to note a couple of things. One is that these numbers are not very big and they do not sum to one. So they're not probabilities that the model is right. They're probabilities given a model of observing the data that we saw. We can also see that the larger of the two, even if it's not very big, is that for the red die. And it's not the absolute value of this probability that matters. It's the relative value. And this um, probability for the red die, 0 0.004, is one and a third times, so 33 and a third percent bigger than the probability for the blue die. And that's quite a lot in, in likelihood terms. So we would say that the maximum likelihood estimate of the model is the red die. And we can be a bit more formal about this and uh, consider that the uh, the data has some particular quantity, say D, we'll call it just D. And we can say that we have some probability of selecting the particular blue or red dice to start with, say half each. And we can introduce some notation. So we can talk about the probability, the P is probability of the data given, the vertical bar means given the model. So this notation means the probability of the observed data, that's our outcome, given the blue die. And this notation means the probability of the data given our, uh, given our model being the red die. And I can reverse this um, conditionality. So this is a conditional probability, the probability of D conditioned on B or the probability of D conditioned on R. But I'm sort of actually interested in the probability that the model is right, rather than that the data came from the model. And so I would be going, well, I really want the probability of the model given the data. And so I can actually use a formula from uh, the very famous math, um, statistician, Reverend Bayes, you know, the Bayes formula in its very simplest form to do this transformation would be as follows. So the probability of B given B is equal to the probability of the data given the model times the probability of the model. And in our case, I said that the probability of selecting the dice, the dice was half each. So this is 0.5 and then divided by the probability of the data. Now, the probability of the data under these circumstances is the probability that I choose the blue die times the probability of the data given that I choose the blue die. Alternatively, I could have chosen the red die and multiply that by the probability of given the data given that I chose the red die. So this is the probability of observing those data. If I didn't know which um, model I had chosen, if these were still expressed as probabilities, so it was uncertain, then the probability of observing the data is the sum of those two terms. Everything else in this formula has changed the same. The numerator on top has, has stayed as it is. And that's Bayes' formula. Similarly, we can do the same for the probability of the red die. The denominator stays the same throughout. Um, and so the probability of the red die given the data is simply the probability of the, the data given the red die times the probability of R over the probability of D. As it turns out for our very simple example here, probability of R and probability of B are the same. And so this probability of B given the data and probability of R given the data are just going to be uh, simple multiples of the original 
probabilities 0 0.003, 0 0.004. And so we can think of these conditional probabilities as the relative likelihoods of the model given the data. And that's what we'll be working with when we're talking about likelihoods for phylogenetic analysis. So that was a very, very simple example, but it did show us some the important concepts. So first of all, we can turn around the probability of give the data given the model to the probability of a model given the data. Of the models considered, which was only two models, which is a significantly small set of models, it was possible to choose which one was more likely. And that's the one that had the high probability of giving us the data that we saw. And the other thing, of course, we could note is that these likelihoods were pretty small. They don't have to sum to one, so they're not probabilities. So in practice, these likelihood values do get very, very small. Rather than risk a numerical underflow when the numbers get too small to be stored, we take the natural log. So it's much more common to see log likelihood being talked about than likelihood. Um, in fact, it's so common that people often say likelihood when they mean log likelihood, so just be aware of it. So now let's think about probabilities in a slightly more phylogenetic sense. We're going to consider substitutions of one nucleotide to another in some fixed amount of time, say one million years. So we might imagine that we have some experimental evidence to say that the probability of, uh, say, a G changing to an A might be 0 0.01 in that time. And this is a very simple model. So we're going to say that the probability of changing from any nucleotide to a different nucleotide in one million years is 0 0.01. And so the probability that it stays the same must be one minus three lots of 0 0.01, giving us the 0.97. So we can then easily calculate the probability for a single nucleotide going from one state to another, say A to G, and that's just by reading it straight off that graph. Now, one of the big assumptions that we make in phylogenetic analysis is that the sites evolve independently of each other. And that means that just as we did for the dice example, to calculate the probability of multiple things happening, we simply multiply the probabilities of the individual things. So the probability of going from, say, sequence AAGT to AGGA is the product of the individual probabilities of going from A to A, A to G, G to G, and T to A. And reading those all off that matrix, it's simply um, a product 0 0.97, 0 0.01, 0 0.97, 0 0.01, which gives us about 0.94 times 10 to the minus 6. So it's a pretty small number. Now, phylogenetic analysis doesn't always happen um, in chunks of one million years. Frequently, we'll want to deal with um, other time amounts, other durations. Just to keep things simple, we'll suppose that we now uh, have uh, a two million year period. Now, conveniently, in order to calculate the probability of going from, say, one state to another in two million years, given we know this probability from 1 million years, it's simply the square of that matrix. So for twice the amount of time, I'm multiplying the exponent up here by two, because I can imagine that this matrix has an exponent of one. It's one. It's the matrix to the power of one, just one copy of itself. Uh, but I can square a matrix using standard linear algebra. Um, and if you need help with that, then um, there's lots of online packages to help you understand how you can square matrices, but um, I, I think it's safe to assume that you know how to square a matrix. So if we square this matrix, we get these values. And again, you can see that the uh, values that are off the diagonals are all the same as each other. And that's because the values off the diagonals are the same as each other to start with. The values on the diagonal are much larger. Well, they've gone down a bit, and the values of the diagonal have gone up a bit. It's interesting that they haven't gone up by twice as much. And the reason for that is that 
this squaring process allows for the possibility of, for example, an A changing to a G and then back to an A again, um, or from a G to a C and then onto a T, so that we contribute to a G to T change, and so on. So as we square matrices, then we allow for many more sort of paths through the possible set of nucleotides that we might go, go through from one nucleotide to the final nucleotide, including staying as it was to start with. So A to A, or A to G to A, or A to C to A, or A to P to A. So if we have this uh, property, if we have a probability matrix for a particular fixed time, we can um, raise that matrix to higher and higher powers or smaller powers perhaps to get probabilities for different amounts of time. And this actually doesn't really generalize very well. And it doesn't really make sense to have a fixed probability for a fixed time period when we start trying to do phylogenetics in practice. So instead of working with probability matrices, we actually work with rate matrices. So this is an equivalent rate matrix for the probability matrix that you just saw, where everything off the diagonal is the same. But the difference is that rather than the row sums, that's the sum of all of the values in a particular row, being one, for a rate matrix, they're zero. And what that means is that the rate of um, changing from A to A plus A to G plus A to C plus A to T is comes out as zero. Now, in order to turn to turn a rate matrix into a probability for an arbitrary amount of time, we use something called matrix exponentiation, uh, which looks like this. This might be a very strange concept to think about because this is the natural number E, which you're probably familiar with, but e to the power of a matrix is slightly non-standard, uh, except in this space. Rest assured, there's very well-defined ways to evaluate these quantities um, so that we can easily convert between rate matrices and probabilities uh, on uh, a tree, because ultimately we want to find probabilities of sequence evolution on trees with particular values of their rate matrices so that we can find the tree and the rate matrices that maximize the probability of observing the data that will give us our maximum likelihood of trees. It's worth noting that some of these um, rate matrices are much easier to work with than others. And so, for example, the Dukes Panther model, where uh, all of the off-diagonal values are the same as here, is very easy to work with. And um, the HKY85 model is very easy to work with as well, but the more general models require numerical approaches. So there are many models of sequence evolution around. There are different matrices with different structures, all the way from the very simplest with one parameter right up to very general models, one called the general time reversible model. Um, and they also have other sorts of variations that can be built on top of them, including things like different nucleotide frequencies. Now in this model, there's an implicit assumption that the nucleotides all occur in the same proportion, so 25% each through time. Uh, but there are models that allow those to be different. We know that that's uh, biologically realistic because in many species or clades of species, there is an, a GC imbalance that takes it away from a total uh, 50%. Also, these models allow for different sites to evolve at different rates. So while there might be the same relative proportions of substitutions between the different nucleotide types, the overall rate of substitution might be different. It's also important to remember that likelihoods are going to be expressed as uh, log likelihoods, possibly negative log likelihoods, and that these numbers are really, really small. So a log likelihood of sort of 37,000, which you might see if you do the Anolis IP tree analysis, or 80,000 or 100,000 or whatever. These are, these are not unusual. And they're ridiculously tiny 
probabilities because this is the log of the probability that we're talking about here. That's not actually a huge issue. It's the relative likelihoods that matter, relative likelihoods, which means that it's the differences in the log likelihoods. So a relative dis difference in probabilities translates to a, an absolute difference in log likelihoods. A model is then going to be selected to give us the best chance of getting the phylogeny right. So coming right back to the uh, motivation, it's not generally speaking the main goal of phylogenetics to work out the model. But if we want to get the best chance of inferring the phylogeny correctly, then we should use the best model possible. There's a lot of models. Uh, obviously, some have more parameters than others, and the more parameter-rich models will tend to fit better um, in simple terms because the simpler models can be special cases of the general models. So we need to avoid overfitting. And the general practice then is to penalize the log likelihood value. And it's based on how complicated the model is. We know that as we add more parameters, so the more complex the model, we are going to do at least as well, and in almost every case, better in terms of the likelihood. So we need to find some sensible way to penalize the likelihood um, based on how many parameters there are to avoid this overfitting. So common penalties are the Akaiki information criterion. Um, in the original paper, I think it was described as an information criterion, but everybody has named it after the first moon rank of it. There's also a corrected AIC or AIC little c, and there's a Bayesian version as well, BIC. And you'll see all of those, and IQ3 does produce the values for all of those penalties. So they're very similar to each other. Uh, they're all based on the original log likelihood. In fact, on based on to twice that, but they penalize based on the number of parameters in different ways. So AIC um, penalizes on the number of parameters K by taking 2K minus two times the log likelihood. So AIC values are gonna be positive values because the log likelihoods are going to be negative. AICC adds an additional penalty, and it is based on the number of parameters and the size of the data, N. In many circumstances, and this is contentious in phylogenetics, the size of the data, in quotes, is hard to determine, and so, AICC and BIC, which also uses the size of the data, can be tricky to get right. I think that's one of the reasons, perhaps I may be wrong, that AIC is simply the commonest version. And that's the default that's used in IQ3. Another important thing to know about likelihood is that it's essentially directionless. And this is a direct result of the nature of the substitution matrices. In those substitution matrices, which were essentially symmetric, except for perhaps effects of the base frequencies, there's no actual difference between the probability of going from sequence A to sequence B um, or going from sequence B to sequence A. So that in turn means that the output trees that we get are going to be unrooted which means that further down the track, if we want to do uh, a rooted tree, if we want to find a rooted tree, we'll need to find some way to root it. One way is to do midpoint rooting, find the middle of the tree and call that the root. Another way is to consider an outgroup uh, or set of uh, taxa, which are confidently not part of the group that we're trying to resolve the phylogeny for. And you can see that in the rest of the tutorial. I'll note also that there are some asymmetric models. Uh, and these are in IQ tree. There are models that are being developed all the time. And IQ tree is very good at keeping up with those. 
but they are beyond the scope of this tutorial and they're not actually commonly used. So active development, and it may be that these become more, use, uh, more used further down the track, but at the moment, uh, they're not commonly used. So we don't worry about them now. So let's think about what we have to do in terms of finding the most likely tree and model. Um, and I've got a sort of a toy algorithm written out here. So we can imagine that this is what we would want to do. We're going to, for every tree in the tree space, we're going to check each possible parameter value in the substitution rate matrix. And for each branch length of that tree, calculate the log likelihood of the alignment. So that's for every tree, for each parameter, and for each parameter of the tree, that's the branch length. There may be other parameters as well. We're going to calculate the log likelihood of the alignment. Now, if we did just that and selected every tree in tree space, this would take a ridiculously long amount of time, which we don't have. And so instead, there are a number of very clever tricks that I used to search the space more efficiently. Um, and to do faster calculations of the log likelihood and to avoid having to check over, for example, all of the potential sequences that there might be within the tree at the internal nodes. We don't have to do that, thankfully. So there's all of these clever speed up that have been made. However, calculating maximum likelihood trees is slow. Let's think about some likelihoods under some of the models that we've been thinking about. So the first one would be uh, Jutes Cantor 69. And that's the one where the rate matrix here, I've given it Q for a rate matrix. Uh, all of the off diagonal values are say alpha and the on diagonals, I've just got that shorthand to say it's minus the, the sum of the other values so that the row sums equal to zero. This is a nice simple model. I'll note that we can't separate this parameter value alpha from the overall rate. Just as you can't tell people how far away something is by um, how long it's going to take you to drive there without knowing how fast they drive. So if someone says to you, it's an hour away, you still don't know how far it is or how long it's going to take you because you might be driving at different speeds. So effectively, we've just got uh, a very simple search in comparison to the more complicated models coming later, where the tree search is only over trees and branch lengths. So there's only over all possible trees and all possible branch lengths for those trees. The next model I want to talk about is the HKY85. And this is a slightly more complicated model, but not too bad. We have uh, now four parameters because we have three for the relative frequencies of each of the nucleotides. So this is the pi A, pi G, pi C, pi T. That's just a standard notation people use. So pi A is the proportion of sites that are um, adenines and uh, pi G, pi C, pi T, and so on. Now, if I know three of those, so pi A, pi G, pi C, then I must know pi T because they have to sum to one. So there's three parameters from that. And there's another parameter as well, this kappa, which is the relative rates of transitions versus transversions. So that gives us my four parameters. So um, we can either fix this pi um, when we're doing a likelihood search, or we can perhaps estimate it from the observed frequencies. So look at all of the uh, alignments, all of the sequences in the alignment, and just count up how many A, C, C's, and P's there are. Or we can actually use it as a parameter that we um, estimate in the likelihood search, which makes it take longer, but will ultimately be more statistically rigorous. So we can, we can accommodate um, more and more complex um, models with likelihood. In fact, there's no real limit to how complicated our, our models could be, just so long as they are still reasonable, 
um, as in real estate. The more complicated a model is, the more it's going to be penalized anyway, which means uh, very complicated models simply won't get a look in. They just won't be considered. One of the more complicated models that is used is this uh, general time reversible model, or GTR. And that has nine parameters. Three of those come from the base frequencies as before, and the other six come from the uh, just relative rates of each of the kinds of transitions um, of A's, D's, C's, and T's. So I've just arbitrarily chosen some Greek letters here. Um, they are symmetric in a sense. Uh, the betas occur symmetrically, the deltas occur symmetrically, and so on. And we also have the relative amounts of pi A, G, C, and T in the matrix as well. So all of these values are different, and it comes out as nine parameters. So it's much slower to optimize because we're trying to search through a space of nine dimensions now to find the best fit model. Now, another thing that can add more complexity, but more biological realism, is that uh, some sites evolve faster than others. And there are lots of good reasons for why this should be accommodated in our models. Simply, the first one is that some sites are encoding. So if you're comparing coding regions with non-coding regions, the non-coding regions are essentially free to vary. They can evolve much faster than others. Even within um, coding regions, the third codon position sites are usually redundant. They're not always, but they're usually redundant. And so for most amino acids, that third nucleotide is free to vary. So that can evolve faster than the first and second position. Some are under strong selection. So uh, some sites might be very important to maintaining an efficient uh, metabolic process. And so they evolve more slowly or they involve the housekeeping genes. They tend to involve, evolve more slowly. Uh, and some others might be so important that they actually have to stay exactly as they are, else a protein won't fold properly and any variation is going to be lethal. And so these we can regard as fixed. And this means that there, there must be, if we want to be biologically realistic, uh, an accommodation made for different rates for different sites. We call these rates across sites models or RAS models. And so even if the same kind of rate matrix might be applicable in different locations in the um, in a chromosome or in a gene or whatever other locus you're using, then the relative rates of those substitutions might be different. So let's have a quick um, illustration of that. So for example, if my rate matrix that I'd chosen to adopt was the HK85, for this gene, for a gene, I might say that at some positions it's evolving at one rate, and at other positions, although the relative proportions of transitions within that site are the same, there are five times as many substitutions at that site per unit time than there are at this site. So that's that's where rates across sites come in as yet another parameter. And if there are rates across sites, we might want to know, well, how many rates are there? How many rate classes should there be? The more rate classes we have, the better will be the fit, but we will penalize those the number of rate classes. So eventually we will uh, uh, our plateau, we will get a diminishing return on having more rate classes. And what should those rate classes be as well? And how big should they be? So these are all parameters that need to be optimized by something like IP tree to uh, find the best tree. So a little bit more about IP tree. It is definitely the forefront of maximum likelihood tools uh, for phylogenetics. It's absolutely uh, the most advanced tool in terms of the models that it includes. And it's under, um, constant development and uh, new tools and features are going in um, uh, constantly. So if you go to the iqtree.org webpage, 
then you'll see there's the main citation, but also the different methods and models that have gone into IP tree that you can cite there should you use it in your research. Let's think about tree space. And this is not like space space. This is uh, a mathematical abstraction to help us understand uh, how we can move around trees to find the best tree. I don't want to spend time checking every single tree. I want to spend time looking at good trees and then maybe better trees that are similar to them. So this is the mechanism that we use to move around tree space to find the best trees. So what is it? Well, in mathematical terms, it's a network whose nodes, you'll be familiar with the nodes of a network, I'm showing you something in a moment, are trees. And the edges, that's the things that join the nodes, are adjacencies between trees. So it's these two trees are adjacent if there's some way of moving from one tree to the next. And then each node, that's each tree, has some kind of a score. And the score that we're interested in is the likelihood or the log likelihood. But we tend to use them interchangeably as before, bearing in mind that it's the log likelihood, which is the numerical value that we'll be dealing with. So we can't check every tree, there are too many. So we, in a sense, in a sense, wander through the sets of trees, going from one tree to another tree to another tree in the search for the best possible tree. This means that the maximum likelihood tree search is going to be heuristic. It won't guarantee that the tree that we find has the highest likelihood. It probably will, but because this is a computation and a very hard problem, it means that we can't guarantee that it definitely is the optimal tree. So we hope and we assume that the best or that's the most likely trees will have a lot in common with each other. They'll be similar to each other. And fortunately, that actually is the best. The so best trees tend to clump together in tree space. That means once we find good trees in tree space, we can look around there and find even better trees. Well, how do we move around in tree space? The first uh, perturbation, that's a small change that we make to trees is called MNI, or nearest neighbor interchange. I'm just going to take you through how that works and a couple more, and then we'll move on to how IP tree does it. So NNI is a way to transform one tree into another that is very similar to the original one. It effectively consists of finding an edge or a branch that's an internal one that is not at the edge of the tree. This is a, a tip, and we're not interested in the edges joining uh, a tip to an internal um, node. We're interested in the internal edges, so from X to Y in this case, or from Y to Z. So those are the only two internal edges. We can do an NNI move on either of those. And so let's look at how it might work. So suppose here's my tree again, it's just rearranged. I have the edge of interest is the x to y edge. We're going to collapse that. And then we end up with a non binary tree. It's an unrooted tree, but it's not binary. And uh, we're going to then uh, expand out of that collapsed node in either of the two ways possible. So one of them joins A with C, and one of them joins C with B and essentially just rearranges A, B, C, and this small subtree Z going to D or move, rearranges them around this edge of interest, the X, Y edge. So if I scoot through from here rapidly to the next one, you might be able to see that it's the A and the C and the B and this subtree that have been rearranged around that internal edge. You can always come back and have another look at that. For each tree, there are two n minus three neighboring trees under n and i. 
So that's a tree with n leaves. And so for this particular five taxon tree, we would expect uh, five minus three is two times two is four neighbors under n and i. So here's a nice graph network that shows the relationships between these five taxon trees. These are all 15 five taxon unrooted binary trees. The number of unrooted binary trees grows very, very fast. And you wouldn't want to see a figure like this for the six taxon trees because it would have 105 nodes on it. We might imagine that uh, we would start, at, for example, say this tree over here, I've highlighted the D. And perhaps the best tree is over here with a, um, a different configuration. And by applying NNI moves, say to this tree, the NNI moves take us along these blue uh, curves. I might go to this tree, and then I might go to this tree, looking at always looking at an improving tree, and then finally end up at this tree where there's no more improvements being made, and I would stop. Another tree perturbation, which is more general, is SPR, that stands for subtree pruning and regrafting. And it essentially works by choosing an edge, cutting the tree at that point, considering the, the smaller part. In this case, if I cut my tree at the red edge, I've got a small part here with just the A, the W, and the B, and reconnecting that smaller part anywhere else in the larger part. So if this were my original, then I could connect it up to there or to there or to there, or to there. And this gives me substantially more uh, neighbors under this operation. And instead of being something that's linear in N, 2N minus 3 for N and I's, it's 4 times N minus 3 times N minus 2. So this number goes up as the square of the number of facts are involved. So this takes longer that has a better chance of giving you a good result because it searches more neighbors each time. Uh, the third of the tree perturbations that we'll consider is tree bisection reconnection. That works by cutting the tree at any internal edge and then considering each part separately, rerouting the parts just formed and then reconnecting the roots wherever we like. So uh, let's go through a, an example of this. So if I imagine that I've got my edge, X, Y edge here, and I'm going to cut my tree, then once I've cut the, that edge, then the X and the Y don't matter anymore. And I'm just suppress those and join W to C and Z to D. And now I can pick any of these branches as uh, roots of the subtrees, so that one and that one and then connect those up. Now, there's not a nice neat form for the number of neighbors under this, but it is uh, larger again than the number under SPR, so more than um, um, NNI as well. Now, let's talk about some hills, because this idea of um, searching through a space of solutions, in this case trees, and always looking at a better tree is called hill climbing. And you can see why. It's because, for example, if it weren't a beautiful clear day as it is in this photograph, and we were stuck on, say, this saddle point here where my cursor is, I hope you can see my cursor on the right, then if I were to go up this little hill, I would end up at the far right of this photograph on that little red patch, and I might think that I'd come to the top of the hill. If I couldn't see very far, if it's foggy, um, then that would be my best guess is at the height of this range of hills, and that would be wrong. Ideally, we want to be able to climb up all the way, perhaps to this point, and in fact, even beyond to this point, which might be the highest one. So let's talk about hill climbing more abstractly. Um, tree search algorithms use hill climbing and other more sophisticated heuristics 
but essentially they work in this, in this way. So we start with a reasonably good estimate. That might be something like neighbor joining. And neighbor joining does work pretty well. It builds a tree, it builds a reasonably good tree, it doesn't come with any guarantees, and it won't be necessarily as good as the maximum likelihood tree. But it might get us close. So we can imagine that neighbor joining gets us perhaps somewhere on the slopes of this highest peak over here, the back, or even the, the middle peak there. Then once we've got to that point, we check all the neighboring trees. This is where the analogy to real hills breaks down, because instead of walking around in nice three-dimensional space, we're walking around this, um, which isn't in a dimension of space and has some large number of neighbors and is very complicated to move around. So tree search algorithms will check all the neighboring trees using that complicated tree space network. Um, given a particular perturbation that we're using, for example, N and I, and of those neighboring trees, we'll find uh, an acceptable new tree. We hope that we'll find one that's better than our current tree, uh, perhaps the best amongst the neighbors. And if we find that there's no acceptable new tree, for example, one that isn't better, then uh, we stop. Otherwise, we move to that tree and we just repeat that process until we can't find uh, an improving tree. That would correspond to us reaching the top of echo. Note, again, it's important to remember that because this is a heuristic, we can't guarantee that we won't simply have a local optimum like this peak here versus a global optimum, which would be that peak at the back. We can't guarantee it. There are lots of good um, tweaks for these heuristics that allow us to get out of local optima and try and find better global optima. Um, but that's um, something that we can rely on IQ tree to do pretty well and not worry about how it does it exactly here. This just gives you a general overview of how tree search works. This is a nice figure uh, from a paper from 2019 in the BioRT, which is talking about um, phylogenetic networks using hybridizations and things like that. But they also had this lovely figure in, which is actually the same figure as the, the same network as we had before. Uh, it's the same set of five taxon trees conveniently labeled A, B, C, D, E, but they are uh, just laid out differently. And it will be hard to see, but there are different uh, log likelihoods given on the nodes of this tree as well. Some are higher than others. And we can imagine that we might start at one tree over on the right, the A, B, C, E, D pattern there, where the black arrow is showing, and walk in tree space following that path, and then perhaps going around that, um, the loops, um, the arcs on this path again and again and again, and ultimately ending up in this sort of region where the probabilities of the trees are the highest. This is uh, not what hill climbing does, but it does illustrate how you might be walking around in this tree space. Let's have a look at the Anolis phylogeny. This is the data set that's used in the tutorial. So Anolis is a highly species genus of lizards. There are over 400 species uh, native to the Americas, and uh, that 400 species is de highly dependent on which genus you think each species goes in, and it's possible that the species named currently in Anolis should actually be in a different genera. And so this is questionable, which of course is another reason to uh, do better phylogenetics. Very pretty little lizard. So where does it fit? And uh, in order to find out where it fits, uh, perhaps not that particular species, I used IQ tree and the um, uh, IQ tree two version, in fact, I used on my command line. And so here's my calling of the IQ tree 
uh, program on the command line. I've said dash s to give it this data set. And this is part of the output. So this um, runs on Galaxy, but I ran this on my command line uh, just to show you some of the output and step through it. So there's quite a lot of output here. It does a quick check. First of all, it gives you the citation. Um, uh, does a quick check of your hardware and then starts to check the uh, different sequences for the um, uh, GC balance, the ACGT, in fact, um, balance um, to see if they're okay to use. There's frequently uh, a p values of sort of 1%, 2%, and some um, sequences fail, but that's actually not something to worry about, as it turns out. Um, it's uh, it's a very conservative test, and it's very common for many sequences to pass, a whole bunch to fail, but your phylogeny is okay. The next chunk of output is uh, telling you how IQ3 is starting its search. So it's actually creating a parsimony tree, and it's uh, done this fast likelihood tree search following that using a particular model, ETR, the general time reversible model, plus I, which means some class of sites are um, fixed, uh, invariant, the I for invariant, and G for the uh, distribution, the shape of the distribution of the rates across sites. So this is a rates across sites model allowing for some sites to be fixed. And so it starts off with an initial log likelihood. Um, this is where my minus 37,000 came from before and starts to do some improving. It starts for this particular tree uh, with rate parameters. This is the rate parameter for A to C substitutions, A to G substitutions, A to T. And the G to T is um, the last one, and that's essentially used as a marker. So everything scales relative to that. So that's why that one is 1.0. It's also noted the base frequencies in the original sequences of 0 0.339, 0 0.261, and so on. It's identified that, whoops, that uh, about 19% of the sites are invariable. They're not only not varying, but they're not allowed to vary. Uh, a parameter to describe that shape, uh, the shape of the distribution of rates, and how long it took. So it's relatively quick. Remember, this was 55 sequences, and it took about a second. Then it goes through and checks under all, uh, most of a very large number of models, um, potentially 286 DNA models. And when you go through and you look at the models that it uh, shows you at the end, you'll find that um, not all of them are produced. And in fact, these models are numbered one, two, three, four, five, up to nine, and then 21. It appears that models 10 to 20 just weren't good enough and didn't, didn't make the final cut, and so they are not reported. So this is going through in order. And we have the negative log likelihood here. So the log likelihood is the neg a large negative number. The negative of that is positive. Uh, this is showing you the number of degrees of freedom. That's a number of parameters in the model. So these are very rich, parameter rich models because of all of these different uh, features to the model. And this is the AIC score, the AICC, and the BIC score. So it does that, goes through a whole bunch of models. So then we're on to searching for trees. And this uh, process is generating a whole bunch of trees based on parsimony, which we haven't gone to in this tutorial. Um, calculates log likelihoods of those 98 initial trees, um, finds good ones, and then it's doing NI search on the best 20 initial ones. And it's doing some reporting on the improved trees that it's found during that NNI search. And so it keeps going until it ultimately ends up with 
uh, the best possible um, candidate tree set. Then it optimizes that set of trees. And so it keeps going and going and going. And ultimately we have improved uh, log likelihoods. Log likelihoods are negative. And you can see how long it's taken over here too. So this is this was happening in real time on my PC. And uh, it, the whole thing took um, a massive 33 seconds. And tree search completed after 128 iterations. So it did a bunch of uh, initial tree construction to find good starting trees. It used a set of trees to iterate over, to find better trees. And after 128 iterations, it stopped. And now this is our um, final part of the output, which is telling us the best tree found. So we've got rate parameters. Again, the G to T is fixed. We also have C to G happens to be the same. Um, and we also have an A to C and an A to T parameter as being the same. And that corresponds to the particular structure of the model that was found as the best fit model um, and also base frequencies i think are identical they're very close to the initial estimated base frequencies but they might have varied slightly we also have uh, estimates of the proportion of sites in the different rate categories so what this is saying is uh, approximately 32% of the sites were in a rate category where the relative rate was 0 0.029. This is relative to an average of one, I guess. 22% of the sites had a rate about 10 times higher, 0.3. 23% of the sites had a range, uh, had a rate about three times higher than that, 1.08, and so on, going off the screen there. And so ultimately, we find the total tree length, that's the sum of the branches, and the amount of evolution of time, if you like, 10.6, uh, and then 28 iterations, half a minute or so to do the whole thing, and that's um, the end. So that all runs quite nicely with no extra defaults given, um, no extra parameters, and um, outputs your tree. It outputs your tree to um a, a file and the tree file is in new it format as discussed before and then if you want to open that up and visualize that you can do that on galaxy um, and here is a visualization i've made and i rerouted that tree so remember that likelihood is essentially symmetric and most likelihood analyses are symmetric and so give you an unrooted tree and that wasn't particularly well rooted because it was just in the middle and my root was somewhere over here i think so i knew what my intended out group was it was these two species down the bottom diplolanus darwinii and phenicosaurus acuterus acuterostris and so i selected the branch uh, that connected that clade of two species to the rest and made that the root and that's the output of my tree there. And that's a reasonably good tree. And um, well, that's your best likelihood tree, your most likely tree. Now, beyond maximum likelihood trees, um, there's two different ways we could go. One is to think about networks. Um, it's, that's the next video. And another is to think about Bayesian analyses um, similar to our approach earlier with turning probabilities from uh, of data given models to probability of models given data uses Bayesian analyses and with those you can add prior information as well like perhaps what you think an evolutionary rate might be on one branch or uh, the age of a clay if you have some fossil records and things like that that's well outside the scope of this uh, tutorial but uh, if you are interested, then there's some good documentation accompanying the beast and Mr. Bay's tools as well. Uh, that's all for now. And so the next uh, video is on networks. And thank you very much for your attention.